What's up guys? So I've been going down the rabbit hole of mechanical keyboards for a while now. I moved from a traditional keyboard to a pretty standard 60% mechanical keyboard and eventually a year and a half ago I built my first custom split mechanical keyboard called an iris. I've really loved using this split keyboard, especially when it comes to programming and using it alongside tools like Tmux and Vim. But there were some things I wished were a bit better. I wanted it to be more compact and easier to travel with, and I really wanted it to be wireless. Especially because using a split keyboard like this normally requires you to carry around two different cables. So about three weeks ago, after doing some research, I got the parts I needed to build a new one. I decided to make the wireless version of a popular minimalist split keyboard called a Korn. In this video, I'm gonna talk about my experience using this keyboard for the last three weeks, all of the different features and really nice benefits that I think it has, some of the downsides I've encountered, and also how I make the most out of using a keyboard like this for programming. I know it might seem really weird, but having a keyboard split in two like this is really nice because it gives you the ability to position each half in a way that's most comfortable to you and can come a really long way when it comes to ergonomics. How this actually works is that one side, usually the left side, is known as the central side and that's connected to the computer itself and the other side is known as the peripheral and that's connected to the left. On a regular wired keyboard like my Iris, the central side is connected to the computer with a USB-C or micro USB cable, and the peripheral side is connected to the central side with a TRRS cable. How it works with this new Korn keyboard I made, which is wireless, is that the central side connects to the computer via Bluetooth, and the peripheral side connects to the central side via Bluetooth as well. This functionality depends entirely on the microcontrollers that you have on your keyboard. Each side of the Korn keyboard has microcontrollers, and if these microcontrollers are Pro Micros or Elite Cs, then the keyboard will be wired and it'll use cables for communication and power. But if instead it uses microcontrollers like the Nice Nanos, then it'll use Bluetooth for communication and rechargeable batteries for power instead. So to make this specific keyboard wireless, I used the Nice Nano microcontrollers. This does mean that each keyboard side needs to be charged separately, which could be a deal breaker for some people. Even though this Bluetooth functionality is amazing in theory, these past few weeks testing out the keyboard, I did encounter some issues with it, but they have mostly been resolved now. For example, I did encounter some issues with Bluetooth interference or latency when I have too many Bluetooth devices connected to my computer at the same time. I had been using my headphones, mouse, trackpad, and now this keyboard all at the same time connected via Bluetooth to my computer. I would also point out that having something between the two keyboard sides can cause some interference and some issues and also having them too far apart from each other. Also note that the central side on this keyboard, which is the left-hand side, can be connected via USB-C to the computer and that would remove any Bluetooth latency when it comes to communicating to the computer itself and it will also keep that side charged. The right hand side's battery would of course still drain but from what I understand it's supposed to last a lot longer than the left. With the batteries I have installed on the two sides which are 110 milliamperes as recommended for the nice nano microcontrollers, the left hand side should last about a week and the right hand side should last about three months with no LEDs or OLEDs installed. I'm not sure how accurate this is and I'm still testing this. If you add the OLED screens, supposedly this goes down to about a day each. I keep these things in mind if you're considering making a Bluetooth keyboard like this. They haven't really been deal breakers for me. All right, let's talk now about the layout on this keyboard. Traditional keyboards have a staggered layout that dates back to the times of the typewriter and has become pretty standard, but this isn't very ergonomic. In contrast, this Korn keyboard has a column staggered layout where the keys are in straight vertical columns, but the columns are slightly shifted so that they better fit the shape of your hands. To be honest, this is one of the things Things that I've come to enjoy the most out of a keyboard like this. My previous split keyboard, the Iris, had a very similar layout to this Korn, and this has really been a game changer for me. I found it makes typing more enjoyable and comfortable, and it also makes keys easier to access. This does introduce a learning curve though, and it can take a while for you to get used to. It might make switching between a standard keyboard and a keyboard like this a little bit harder, but over time I've found I've learned to be able to do this without too much of a problem. As you might have noticed, the Korn keyboard has 21 
keys on each side and the iris has 28. This makes the corn keyboard a lot smaller and more compact and I really like this. I also want to point out that this keyboard has three thumb keys on each side. For those of you that don't know, keyboards like this are made so that you can not only use both thumbs, but each of these can press on more than one key. This is in stark contrast to a traditional keyboard where you normally use just one thumb and it usually just presses on the space bar. All right, so you might be wondering if this keyboard is that small, then how the heck do you have access to all the different symbols and numbers that you would normally have on a traditional keyboard, especially when it comes to someone like me that uses all of these for programming? Well, that's where keyboard layers come in. They're an essential part of using a keyboard like this. You can assign a specific key on your keyboard to activate a given layer where the keys have a different meaning from their default. For example, if I keep this blue key pressed on my keyboard, it changes to a different layer with only symbols and numbers. And if I keep this yellow key pressed on my keyboard, it changes to a different layer instead. I kind of like to think of this as a custom shift key. That's why this keyboard can stay so small and it makes it so that nothing is ever too far away from your fingers sitting on the home row. The way you configure these layers is through the firmware that runs on your keyboard. Firmware gets installed onto the keyboard through a process called flashing. The firmware will be different depending on your microcontrollers. If you have wired microcontrollers like the Pro Micros or Elite Cs, then the most popular firmware here is called QMK. If you're using Nice Nanos instead for a wireless keyboard like this one, then you use ZMK instead, which seems to be the most popular option nowadays. I found that QMK, which is the firmware on my iris, is a little bit easier to work with than ZMK, especially because it has an online configurator that makes things pretty easy. I wanna point out a couple of things when it comes to how I've configured my layers to maximize productivity. My default or base layer has a pretty traditional QWERTY layout. A couple of things to point out here are that I have my escape key on the upper right hand corner of the right side, which is pretty much the opposite of what you have on a traditional keyboard. I put it here because I have the tab key on the upper left hand corner of the left side, and I move the backspace key to one of my right thumb keys because it's a key that I press on a lot. I have the option key on the bottom right hand corner of the right side because it's a key that I don't use that often. I put the control key where it's really easy to access because I use it so often when I'm using Tmux. And I have the command key, lower layer, and enter key for the left thumb, and the space key, backspace key, and raise layer for the right thumb. Now the lower layer is made up primarily of just symbols and numbers. The symbols that you would have on the numbers of a traditional keyboard are all on the top row of the two sides. The bottom two rows of the left side has all my numbers, and the bottom two rows of the right side has the remaining symbols that I need. I believe this took me more than a month to get used to, but nowadays it's just muscle memory for me. My upper layer is a bit more specialized. It has all of my function keys on the top row, and my arrow keys are where H, J, K, and L would be, which is really nice because H, J, K, and L are what I use to move around within Vim, and these are like second nature to me. On the left hand side, I also have keys for previous and next, which I use often to change between songs, and also lowering and raising the volume, which I also use a lot. I also have a key for stopping and playing media. These are really nice actually because I use Spotify a lot and I can just use these keys to change songs without having to exit the app I'm currently in and I can also stop and play songs too. Finally, I have my Bluetooth control keys here as well. With the ZMK firmware running on this keyboard, you have access to five different Bluetooth profiles. Each profile allows you to pair the keyboard with a different device. I have five keys here that when pressed will activate that profile. You first activate the given profile and then pair the keyboard with the device. For example, I can press on profile one and connect my keyboard to my MacBook, press on profile two and then connect my keyboard to my phone, and then press on profile three and connect my keyboard to my iPad. After I do this, Regardless of the active profile on the keyboard, whenever any of these devices are close enough to it, they'll show the keyboard as connected. What happens though is that only the device that is associated with the active profile will actually receive keystrokes. I also have a key here to clear the current active profile. So for example, if I want my keyboard to forget my MacBook, I activate profile one by pressing on the profile one key 
and then I press on the clear profile key so that the keyboard forgets the MacBook. This functionality is actually really nice, but for the past few weeks testing out the keyboard, I often found myself confused with the keyboard's current connectivity status. This would mostly happen because I would put my keyboard in my bag and keys would get pressed sometimes and a Bluetooth profile would get cleared or it would change and I wasn't aware of it. All right, let's move on to the switches I'm using on the keyboard. My previous keyboard had pretty basic Cherry MX Brown switches, and this keyboard has Gateron Ink Blacks, which are linear switches, and I heard a lot of good things about. I also lubed these, which was something I had never done before. I find them to be a bit quiet, but I really like how smooth they feel when I type. A key difference with this corn keyboard as compared to my previous split is that this one is hot swappable. It's made for Cherry MX compatible switches, and these aren't soldered directly to the keyboard. You can just insert them and change them or replace them whenever you want or need to, which I think is really awesome. This isn't the case with my other keyboard where the switches are soldered directly to it, and I would have to desolder all of them if I wanted to change them. When it comes to the keycaps on this keyboard, keycaps can have different profiles. This means that they can have different shapes depending on their profile. These specific keycaps are DSA profile, so they're all the same size and shape, which I think is really nice on an ergonomic keyboard like this. You can use DSA or XDA to have keycaps be all the same size and shape. Keycaps can be made out of different materials. You can have PBT or ABS, for example. These keycaps are made out of PBT and and I would highly recommend this because they are more durable and they don't develop a shine over time. I would recommend you look for an ortho linear keycap set or a set of keycaps for a keyboard like the Plank that can work well. Another good option is ordering 42 blank keycaps made out of PBT with a DSA or XDA profile. I wanna finish things off by briefly talking about the case I'm using for the keyboard. This case is called the Analyst, it's pretty minimal. I got this case and most of the parts I needed to make the keyboard from a website called Little Keyboards. They aren't sponsoring this video by the way, that's just where I found most of the things I needed. On this site I also bought a foam layer for each of the sides to help improve the sound a little bit. Somewhere down the line I might get a sturdier case for the keyboard to protect it a little bit better. And I'm also interested in something that allows me to do tenting, which is putting the sides up on an angle, which also should help with ergonomics. And that's it you guys, that's pretty much it for all of the things that I wanted to share with you about this new corn keyboard I've been using. I know that was a lot of information, so thanks for sticking around to the end if you made it this far. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys found the video interesting and helpful. If you did, don't forget to leave a like down below. It really helps me out. Leave a comment if you have any questions or feedback for me. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel to see more content like this from me. See you guys in the next one. Peace.